Hi. Welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. My name is Elizabeth Jacobs. I'm a fellow in governance studies here at Brookings, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to Brookings for what promises to be a fantastic event on the effects of racial preferences in higher education on student outcomes. Now, as many of you here know, next month the U.S. Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in Fisher versus the University of Texas, which is the first case the court has taken up in nearly a decade on the use of race in higher education outcomes. Unlike the 2003 Bollinger cases, the arguments in the current debate focus not on the race for spots at elite schools, but rather on whether racial preferences actually benefit their recipients. And that question is what's at the heart of today's conference, which is organized around new research on the actual effects of racial preferences on students. These are really key questions with, um, with real import for both individuals' economic success and our nation's economic pro prospects. College completion remains the single best predictor of an individual's success in the workforce, yet a substantial imbalance between minority and white graduates persists. And our nation's economic future depends on creating a strong and creating and sustaining a strong pipeline of STEM graduates who are trained, who are in high demand from employers who consistently report problems recruiting appropriately trained graduates. We're very lucky today to have a distinguished set of panelists who are exceptionally well equipped to answer these questions, um, to connect the dots between these and many other ones that I haven't mentioned. So without further ado, I want to turn the stage over to the driving force behind this event, Professor Rick Sander. Dr. Sander received his JD and PhD in economics from Northwestern, and not long afterwards became a full professor at UCLA School of Law. He has a long and impressive history of impact-oriented research on issues of social economic equity, and he's the founder of the empirical research group at UCLA's law school, which is really sort of a perfect combination um, to get at the questions that you guys will be hearing about today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Rick. Thank you, Elizabeth, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to see so many of you turning out at 8.45 in the morning. Um, this is a, an exciting event for us because uh, it's probably probably the first conference of its type to focus on empirical research about how racial preferences actually affect educational outcomes. Affirmative action has, has an, an interesting evolution. In the, in the 1950s and 60s, affirmative action programs started as ways of trying to level the playing field. Federal contracting programs, for example, were modified to try to make sure that exclusionary practices were eliminated and that um, con contracting agencies did a better job of trying to identify the pool of of eligible applicants. Around the end of the 1960s, um, affirmative action began to evolve into racial preference programs and, and some other type of preference programs. These were widely adopted in higher education uh, at the end of the 60s, during the 70s, and the early 80s, and became almost universal at selective colleges and professional schools by 1990. A lot of the debate about racial preferences, and it's always been an intensely controversial issue, was really kind of a normative debate. Um, people had different definitions of what equality of opportunity meant. Did it mean race neutrality? Or did it mean uh, taking into account enough factors that one had reasonable representation of different groups in society? So this moral debate raged for decades, but has gradually, I think, evolved more towards an empirical debate. That process was probably started in 1978 when Lewis Powell wrote the controlling opinion in Bakke uh, versus University of California, the first major affirmative action case taken up by the Supreme Court. And in Bakke, Powell said that um, um, universities could not engage in racial preferences for purposes of kind of general social engineering, but that they could engage in racial preferences to pursue diversity on the campus as a, as a compelling goal if they can show that diversity was important to the achievement of their educational objectives. So that started a period where scholars began to look at what the effects of diversity were. Most of that research, and that research has continued to grow, and, and uh, there were many briefs submitted in the Fisher case about, about this research last month. Um, that research is generally focused on the campus climate as a whole. 
diversity per se is not, is not focused on any, any particular student or any particular group, but upon how uh, increased racial diversity or other types of diversity affect the educational climate. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that research today, but that's not our, prim our primary focus. Because in the 1990s, a different type of empirical research started to take hold. People like Rogers Elliott and Linda Lowry pioneered studies of the effects of preferences on individual student outcomes. In other words, they were effectively trying to shift the debate on affirmative action from is it fair to does it work? Is this, a, is this an effective policy for trying to achieve the goals that affirmative action has? Because whatever Justice Powell might say, the, the reasons that universities were pursuing uh, preferences and pursuing racial diversity was only partly to achieve campus diversity. It was also very much about trying to achieve various social goals. Uh, so this research tried to examine whether preferences had the effect of improving educational outcomes, improving eventual labor market outcomes, um, how they affected the self-perception of students who receive preferences, and so on. Uh, as, as, we're going to, as we're going to explore today, this research has developed slowly, partly because uh, it's very hard to get good data from universities and other higher education institutions about the actual impact of preferences. So an important theme that we're going to be talking about today is, is transparency, data access, and what you actually need to do the kind of research that, uh, that, that all of us participating here are interested in seeing done. But some data sets gradually became available. And as the research that was done became better known, and I think perhaps stimulated some by the Grutter and Grotz decisions by the Supreme Court in 2003, more and more scholars became interested in these questions. And uh, in the last 10 years, there's been a significant growth of research. And that has, has continued to accelerate steadily. So that I, I think in the last two years, probably more research on the effects of preferences has appeared, either as working papers or as published papers, than perhaps in the entire earlier history of the, of the field. Um, that has not been done in anticipation of Fisher. I don't think, I don't think any of us here today started our work uh, anticipating that the Fisher case would come up. And indeed, the Fisher case does not directly pose uh, these issues. I, I think some of us think that it indirectly poses interesting empirical issues, and, and those will probably come up today. But Fisher is, is a more traditional case that's really focused largely on um, what the Grutter case means and what are the legal boundaries of, of, uh, of the use of racial preferences by universities. Nonetheless, these, you know, these empirical issues, these questions about what affirmative action does are a very important undercurrent in shaping the debate, shaping how universities view what they're doing, how the public views uh, preferences, and so on. So today we're going to try to present a range of what we consider to be the most exciting research being done in this field. And uh, I've got to say, the most thrilling thing to me about this conference is that every single person that I asked to come said yes. So we have no second stringers here. Uh, We've got, uh, we've got, well, I, I, I won't use any sports analogies, but we have a, we have a very nice uh, group of people presenting, and I think you're going to find this work both intellectually rigorous and, and accessible and engaging. We're going to have two panels this morning that will focus on presenting academic papers. The first one is going to present papers that uh, are fairly eclectic and kind of illustrate the general challenge of trying to study the impact of uh, of preference policies on students, uh, data challenges, analytic challenges, and so on. Um, Glenn Lowry is going to preside over that panel. Then we're going to have a panel that's going to focus on one of the most interesting areas of, uh, of impact research. It's going to look at the question of science mismatch, which is the issue of whether students who receive preferences um, have better outcomes if they end up at a school where their academic preparation is similar to those of their fellow students, or if they instead go to a more elite school where other students have generally stronger academic preparation than they do. Uh, this has been a question people have wondered about for a while. There's 
uh, been progressively more exciting research done, and, and you're going to see it today. After those two panels, we're then going to stop with PowerPoints and slides and numbers, and we're going to have uh, uh, several people who are keen observers and participants of the affirmative action debate uh, lead a luncheon roundtable, and uh, Stuart Taylor will be presiding over that. In all these sessions, we are leaving lots of time for uh, your involvement, and we look forward to your questions. So let's start panel one. Um, Glenn Lowry is going to lead it. He's the Merton Stoltz Professor of Social Science and Professor of Economics at Brown University. He's taught at Boston, Harvard, Northwestern. He's been a, a leading figure in public discourse about a whole series of issues related to race and inequality for the last 20 or 30 years. He has a uh, a uh, doctor in economics from MIT and a bachelor's in mathematics from Northwestern. He's also worked broadly in applied microeconomic theory, welfare economics, game theory, industrial organization, natural resource economics, and the economics of income distribution. He's lectured for academic societies around the world, and we're very delighted to have today Glenn Lowry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, very uh, happy to be greeting you this morning and to be introducing uh, this panel. Uh, these are going to be papers which are a, empirical statistical analyses of data sets aimed at getting at some of the questions that um, Rick was just uh, mentioning in terms of the effects of affirmative action on uh, student outcomes. <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is introduce the speakers in the order in which they will uh, speak and then I'm going to leave the stage and allow the uh, presentations to proceed. So um, Kate Antonovich, as you can see here with uh, Richard Sanders' paper on affirmative action bans and a chilling effect using uh, California data to investigate uh, whether the uh, imposition of an affirmative action ban affected the students' willingness, African-American and Latino students, to accept admission at the university. Um, and. Uh, let me, Kate is going to be doing the presentation. Kate Antonovich is uh, on the economics faculty of the University of California at San Diego. She received her PhD from uh, Wisconsin in economics in uh, 2000 and has written papers on uh, topics about uh, race and gender discrimination, um, intergenerational mobility, uh, and her papers have appeared in the American Economic Review, the Journal of Labor Economics, and the Journal of Human Resources. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers and then I'm going to allow them to proceed, okay. Um, the second paper by Kala Krishner and uh, Veronica Robles uh, is on affirmative action in uh, higher education in India. And I'd just like to introduce uh, Kala, Kala Krishna and uh, Veronica. Uh, Kala Krishna is a liberal arts research professor of economics at Penn State University. Uh, she's also a research associate at the National Bureau for Economic Research and a fellow of the CES IFO in Munich. Uh, she's taught at Harvard and at the Fletcher School, received her doctorate from Princeton, uh, and has published widely in international trade, uh, economic development, and industrial organization. And Veronica Robles is a research economist at the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, received her doctorate in economics from Penn State in 2012. Uh, and works in the field of applied microeconomics. Uh, she's from Peru and has worked at the prestigious think tank uh, in uh, Peru Grade uh, for six years. Um, finally, the third uh, presentation in this morning's uh, panel is by E. Douglas Williams, uh, who is the Wilson Chair of Economics at Swanee University of the South um, and chair of uh, his department he received his doctorate in economics from Northwestern University, studying under the Nobel laureate Dale Mortensen. Uh, Doug served as a budget advisor to the city of Milwaukee and has taught at uh, Carleton College. His research uh, has examined the legal profession, environmental uh, resource management, and living wage laws, and Doug's uh, paper is going to examine the uh, effect on academic outcomes and legal education of, uh, of mismatch. So that is the panel uh, forthcoming, 
And uh, with that introduction, I'll invite the first uh, presenter, Kate Antonovich, to uh, take the stage. There'll be Q&A after the presentations. Okay, so um, this paper is entitled Affirmative Action Bans and the Chilling Effect. It's joint with um, Rick Sander, who you all just met because he was up here speaking with you. Um, I want to start by just giving you a little bit of background um, and, and defining some terms because as it turns out, um, the term affirmative action, which is one of the first terms I want to want to define, is, is a debated term in this, in this literature. And so in this paper, when we're talking about affirmative action, what we're, what we're explicitly referring to are instances in which there are explicit racial preferences in college admissions. So in other words, admissions officers are using race as a criterion in admission and determining admission partially on the basis of, of, a candidate's, of a candidate's race. And there are other forms of affirmative action that you can imagine, but th that's, this is what we're, we're talking about in this paper. Um, in terms of um, our ability to study affirmative action and, and, I, I'll, I'll, and the chilling effect, and I'm, the next slide is going to tell you what the chilling effect is all about, but in order, one of the, the, the key thing that is enabling us to really understand the effect of affirmative action on, and the chilling effect is that in 1996, California voters um, approved Proposition 209. So Proposition 209 um, was, uh, it was approved um, in November 1996, and it added to the state constitution the following language. Uh, the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting. So this really um, was, was perceived, and I think correctly, obviously, that the University of California system could no longer practice um, affirmative action or, or, or explicit racial preferences in college admissions, which they had done up until that point. They, they were thinking about race in, in determining the admissions process. For various reasons, um, the Proposition 209 wasn't implemented immediately. Um, it went into effect starting with the freshman class of 1998. So students who probably were sending applications off in the fall of 1997 were admitted um, in the spring of 1998 and were entering in the, in the, in the fall of 1998. That's, that's really the, the group for whom this ban immediately took effect. So students who were started at any UC school in the fall of 1998 um, were admitted um, without, any, without any explicit racial preference. Um, what is the chilling effect? Um, so, the, and that's really what we want to understand. In this paper, what we're trying to understand is what is the, what is the effect of this ban, or was there a chilling effect of this, of this ban on, on minority students? So there's a general recognition, of course, that Proposition 209 was going to lower the proportion of um, underrepresented minorities at the UC just simply because their, their admission rates were going to be lower. But there was also this concern about this, this so-called chilling effect. And the idea of the chilling effect was this fear that um, minorities would lose interest in attending the University of California because the ban would change the campuses in ways that would make them less attractive to, to minorities. So it's not just that they weren't getting admitted, but that perhaps they also would not want to attend, that the schools would fundamentally become less appealing to them. And that is, of course, a, a concern because, um, you know, I, I think people just sort of generally thought that, you know, it's, it's one thing for, for students to not be getting in, but for them to not to actually want to come to the UC anymore is, is sort of this added layer of, of concern. And you might want to ask, well, what are the possible mechanisms? You know, why, why would a ban on affirmative action um, chill minority interest in, in attending the University of California? And one was just simply this idea that the ban could connote institutional hostility, that, that, the, that minorities might perceive that they were just sort of no longer welcome at the University of California. Um, but, of course, the other issue is that um, there, there's this reality that minorities were going to have many fewer own race peers on campus after the ban went into the effect. And, the, and to the extent that that's important, that could, that could deter minorities, even those who had been admitted, from actually attending, uh, from actually attending the school. So just to give you a, a, a broader sense or a richer sense of, of what these concerns were all about, um, there, was a, uh, there was, for example, a, a quote from... Um, a high school senior who was admitted to Berkeley in, in the spring of 1998, and, and she said, okay, they don't want me, I don't want to go there, their commit to, commitment to affirmative action is not there. So this, again, this idea that there, there might be this institutional hostility that, that it might chill minority, minority interest in attending uh, the UC. Another quote, um, uh, another um, black 
student who was admitted, uh, who, was a, who was a student at Berkeley in 2004 observed, the situation is not conducive to black students coming here. It's difficult as students to reach out to, pers to prospective minority students and tell them they'll be welcome with open arms. Again, presumably because they would have so many fewer or um, own race peers. And then the director, uh, this is sort of a surprising quote, but the director of black student development, Grace Carroll at, at Berkeley, remarked in May 1998, this is the first year I've told students who asked me not to go to Berkeley, but to go to Stanford. Okay, so you actually have cases in which administrators might have actually been actively discouraging students from coming to the campus because they, they would fear that it would just not be a, a welcoming place for them. So what we're trying to understand in this paper is the extent to which this is true, the extent to which minority interest in attending the University of California system was actually chilled by, um, by banning racial preferences. So there are a couple ways you might go about trying to think, you know, you could think about studying the chilling effect. One is to start and just sort of look at enrollment share. So what's the fraction of minorities on campus and how did that change after the ban went into effect? But of course that doesn't just get at the chilling effect because part of the reason why minority enrollment shares fell at the University of California was not just because minorities might have lost interest in attending, but that they were not admitted it at much lower rates after the ban went into effect. So that's, you know, I have a little red X there, meaning that's not really, you know, that's not really going to get at it. Um, you could also think about looking at application rates. You could just say, oh, did minority application rates change after the ban went into effect? But again, the problem there is that when you're thinking about it, when a student is thinking about whether or not they should apply to a certain school, they're, they're, they have in mind the likelihood that they're going to be admitted. And it's possible that minority application rates to the UC could have fallen simply because students feared that they were no longer going to be admitted, so why bother sending an application? So again, doesn't seem like a great candidate. Um, instead, what we're going to do in this paper is look at yield rates. So this is um, the probability that a student enrolls in a particular campus conditional upon being admitted. So we're going to take the group of students who are admitted to a University of California school and ask what's the likelihood that given their offer of admission, they actually subsequently enrolled in the school. And take that as a metric of, of whether or not there was any sort of change in minorities' interest in attending the UC. So the basic approach is going to be to study, and actually let me define one more term. URM is the, is the UC's term that they use for underrepresented minorities, and that includes at the UC um, blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, although Native Americans make up a very small fraction of, of minority students there. But our basic approach in this paper is going, to is going to be to study how URM yield rates changed after Prop 209. So we have this three-year period immediately before Prop 209, 1995 to 1997, and we're going to compare that to URM yield rates in the three-year period immediately following the implementation of Prop 209. Now you might want to ask, well, what are some of the possible problems with this research approach? Um, one is that there could be that there are a change in the characteristics who are, of students who are admitted before and after um, Prop 209 went into effect. And our solution um, is going to be to use really rich administrative data from the University of California that allows us to control for changes in student characteristics. Because again, the, the pool of students who are admitted is, is going to be really different before and after the ban. The other big problem is you might think, well, what if there's a, just a change over time or either an increase or a decrease in the sort of student's interest in the University of California? Maybe the University of California becomes more, more appealing to students, less appealing to students. And so our idea here is going to be to, to compare the change in the yield rates of underrepresented minorities to the change over time in the yield rates of non-underrepresented minorities. And, and in, the, in this... This, you know, this is often called difference in difference estimation. So we want to compare how did the yield rate of, of minorities change relative to the change in the yield rate of non-minorities and, and take that difference as some measure of, of how minority interest in the University of California might have changed. We're going to be using um, a really rich administrative data from the University of California. We have data on uh, every fall freshman applicant from 1995 to 2000. Um, for those students, we know their SAT scores, we know their high school GPA, we know something about parental income and parental education, um, we know whether they were admitted to a particular UC campus, um, and if they were admitted, the set of schools um, at, which they, at which they enrolled. Um, and so it's a very, very useful, um, useful data set. But again, for the, for, in our empirical analysis, we're going to be focusing on, on the admits and, and asking whether or not they actu actually enrolled. <clears throat> so just to give you a sense of um, sort of a picture, I like, I like pictures, um, this shows you the percentage difference between URM and non-URM fall freshman yield rates. So um, for example, the, the very top line, I don't know if that's a taupe colored line, or, but that's, that's UC Riverside, the, the, the top colored line there, and the, 
as you can see in 1994, um, URMs, you know, conditional upon being admitted, were 50% more likely to enroll in Riverside than, than non-minority students. And when the line is negative, it means that the minority students, uh, for example, the blue line, the, the sort of royal blue line there is Berkeley in 1994, minority students were about 10 percentage points or 10% less likely to, um, to enroll in, in Berkeley uh, in 1994 than, than non-URMs. And so one of the things you see here is that right in, right, and so Prop 209 went into effect in 1998. So the dashed vertical line there is when Prop 209 went into to effect. And actually the solid lines bracket the, the years in which we're looking at, the years of data that we're looking at in this paper. Um, and so one of the things you see here is this dramatic jump up in the enrollment rate um, or the, the, uh, of, of minority students right around the time that Prop 209 went into effect. Okay, so this is controlling for nothing. There's, there's, we're not controlling for changes in the characteristics of students or anything like that. But I just wanted to show you kind of the basic empirical sort of pattern that sort of motivated this question of, you know, should we, you know, what's going on here? What could be explaining this jump in, the, in, in minority, in minority uh, yield rates right around the time Prop 209 went into effect? So let me just um, jump straight to some of our main results. So what we're going to do, what we, what we do is we basically say, well, how to, controlling for changes in student characteristics and very importantly, controlling for the set of school, the changes in the set of schools to which students were admitted, um, how did their likelihood of, how did the likelihood that minorities would enroll in a particular campus change relative to the likelihood that, that non-minorities would enroll in a particular campus? And for at Berkeley, for example, you see a, approximately a 5.7 percentage point increase in the likelihood that an admitted minority was going to enroll in, uh, in, in the University of Cal in, in Berkeley, conditional upon being admitted. And the numbers are, are a little bit smaller for um, some of the other campuses, but still, um, you know, substantial and, and statistically significant. Now, just to give you an idea of the magnitude there, I also have um, the baseline yield rate um, for minority students. Um, in, um, at Berkeley before the ban went into effect, it was about 37.9%. So before Prop 209 went into effect, approximately 37.9% of minorities who were offered admission to the University of, to, to Berkeley actually enrolled. Um, so a little bit under a little bit under 40%. And as you can see, you know, if you get into Berkeley, you're really really likely to go. And, and as you as the schools get somewhat less selective, those those yield rates drop a little bit. But when you look at 5.7% and compare that to 37.9%, you get, in the case of Berkeley, about a 15% increase in, in the yield rate for minorities. And as you look, um, you know, as you, I sort of did a rough back of the envelope calculation, you're getting about, you know, down the campuses, somewhere in the order of, you know, a 10% increase in URM yield rates at, at most of the UC campuses. Like at UCLA, you can see it's right at... You know, it's a 3.9 percentage point increase on a base of 38.8 percent, so approximately a 10 percent increase in the yield rates. So um, we might want to understand why is there a warming effect? Um, you know, what, what could possibly... So, so actually, let me go back. This is totally surprising. I haven't... I, the, we were... You know, you we write this paper and you think you're going to get a chilling effect. You think you're going to see a drop in minority <laughs> yield rates, but in fact, minority yield rates actually appear to, to increase. Um, and so that's, that's, that's very surprising. It's not at all the result that, that one might expect. Um, and so we're sort of trying to understand, well, why might this be the case? You know, um, why, why could it, you know, why would you see this jump in, in minority yield rates after you've controlled for student characteristics, et cetera? Excuse me, can I ask you a clarifying question? Yes. What are the acceptance rates relevant to these populations? You're telling us about the effects on yield rates, but I'm just wondering what the acceptance rates are like before and after. So at Berkeley, for example, about 50% of minority applicants were ex given offers of admission prior to Prop 209. And those admissions rates fell to about 25% after Prop 209 went into effect. Sorry, would you say that again? So before Prop 209 yeah. went into effect, URM admission rates were around 50%, and they 50% at Berkeley. Yeah. And then they fell to 25% after Prop 209. So it was a very, like, at Berkeley, it was a very dramatic drop in the admission rate. At, at a school like Riverside, which is far less selective, there was a much smaller drop in the admission rate because there wasn't, there wasn't much, the school wasn't actually all that selective to begin with. So it varies across campuses. Okay, so, um, so one of the things that we thought about in this paper was the possibility that, um, that, that when you ban affirmative action, um, 
there's this, there's this notion that schooling serves as a signal to employers of underlying ability. And when you ban affirmative action, you're essentially increasing the signaling value of going to a particular school. You're, you're, you're allowing you know, employers, et cetera, who are looking at whether or not a minority student has, has graduated from a particular college are going to understand that they went to that school without, without, without having been admitted you know, under any sort of racial preference program, and that that could increase the, the signaling value of attending one of these schools. And so um, the, the, we, in the paper, we build a, a, a small model that really shows that when you have a signaling model of the, of the sort that I just described, um, the increase in that signaling value when you, when you ban affirmative action should be the, should be the largest for, the, um, for students with sort of relatively low academic credentials. And so we can look for that in our data. And indeed, we and do find that it's the case that the warming effect is the largest for students with relatively low levels of academic ability. In other words, the yield rates, this jump in the, in the yield rates was the most pronounced for students who, had, who were admitted but who had relatively weak academic credentials. Okay. So um, I just want to quickly conclude, because I'm seeing that I'm out of time. Um, so surprisingly, we find this increase in minority yield rates after Prop 209. We, we find really no evidence of, of a chilling effect at all. I mean, that, that's sort of the, the hypothesis that I think we might have gone into this paper with, but we found the, the, the absolute re reverse result. Um, and uh, so when you think about this drop in URM enrollment shares at the more selective colleges after Prop 209, you have to understand that this is, you know, our, our paper, one of the results of the paper is that this is primarily because of the fall in their likelihood of being admitted, not because they appear to lose interest in attending the UC school. Minorities maintain their, their interest in attending the UCs. And the paper also, um, you know, I think has some suggestive evidence that affirmative action may have increased the signaling value of, of these degrees and, and actually made it a more appealing school for, for minority students. Um, and, and, you, and you do see that reflected in just sort of anecdotal evidence where students express pride at, at sort of being in the UC despite the, despite the fact that, that no, um, no racial preferences were given in admission. It's, it's, students have mixed feelings about it, but, but I think there is some anecdotal evidence supporting this. Okay, I've overrun my time, so thank you very much, and uh, I'll, I guess the next presenter will come up. Do we have to do anything to change the slides? I think if you just close that. If I just close it? Uh, uh, never mind. Uh, I'll let you flip up. I can do it right now. Okay. Hi, and um, good morning. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is some work that I've been doing with Veronica um, on uh, data from India. And um, might say, why, why India? And um, you know, what's the relevance here? Uh, so in India, Affirmative action has been used in a very, very strong manner. In India, there are um, castes, and traditionally, the lowest caste, called um, sometimes in the old days was called um, untouchables. Mahatma Gandhi called them Harijans, which is children of God. Um, and uh, today, they're called scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. The scheduled tribes were the original uh, inhabitants uh, and got pushed further and further back. So in India, these are groups which have been basically oppressed for a long, long time. So the issue of affirmative action is really one was seen as one of justice in letting people who had been oppressed for a long time have a chance to catch up and take their rightful place in society. Um, so in India, the plan was to use this for the disadvantaged. And hopefully, uh, in the Constitution, it was uh, literally stated that it, this would be done in 25 years. Um, India got independence in 47. Uh, it's still not done. Um, 
and the position of the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes is improved over what it was at independence, but um, they're still behind. Um, so there's um, an intense debate both in India and in the US on the impact of this kind of affirmative action on who it's supposed to benefit. Uh, so in India, there's this issue of uh, does it benefit the people it's supposed to, which is the relatively poor and disadvantaged to the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, or does it end up having what's called a creamy layer effect, which is the best and most uh, well off of the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe are the ones who gain because they're given admission when um, others in the general category would not, and they've had all the advantages. Um, the other question which is very important is, do these kinds of preferences actually help them? Um, in India, this is a great place to look at the data, basically because unlike um, in the US, the differences are huge. So you have admission in India in elite engineering institutions, which are the ones we study, where the admission cutoff for general category is like 97% marks. For the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe category, the cutoff is 50%, and they can't fill the seats. The seat reservations are proportional to population, presence, so 15% for scheduled caste and 7.5% for scheduled tribe. Moreover, India is a great place to do this because unlike in the US where there's choice, everywhere you look there's choice. You go into a, a university, you choose a major, once you get into the major, you choose your courses, some are hard, some are easy, different people have different grading standards, in India, everything is much more rigid, which makes it a much better and easier place to test for things. So that very transparent admission criteria, marks are all that count, extreme preferences, rigid course structures, you cannot choose anything, basically. Uh, <laughs> uh, the reservations also take a particularly interesting form, which is, they're not just for admission into the university, but they are for each major. So what happens in India is that the most elite majors, computer science, electrical engineering, these are ones where you have to be a complete genius to get in, okay? Like 99% cut off for the general category. But you can't fill the reservation quota in the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, even in that major. So what you find is that the proportion of the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe quota that's made up is larger for computer science because it's the most prestigious one and it keeps falling as you go down. So what you see is that you'd expect that scheduled caste, scheduled tribes would be most out of their depth in selective majors, less so in the less selective. So civil engineering, you know, it's not so bad. <laughs> okay. Um, so our data, I mean, this is um, very hard for us to get. We worked for three years to get uh, this data out of them. Um, it's a small data set, but the good part is it's extremely detailed. And as I told you, the setup makes it very amenable to do uh, the kind of research we're interested in. So there are about 450 students who were graduating in 2008. And what we did was we got institutional records from the establishment on GPA, credits by semester, gender, caste, age, major. We also did an exit survey where we got some very interesting data, not just on socioeconomic background, but also, uh, and the first wage after graduation, but also a psychological data in the sense that how happy were you? How stressed did you feel? How comfortable did you feel? Um, I wouldn't be able to say that much about that data today, but uh, it's there in the paper. Um, I want to give you an idea of how selective these places are. You sit for these exams to get into these elite institutions. 
there called the joint entrance exam. The success rate here is roughly 2%. So 2% of the applicants get in. Compare this to Harvard and Princeton, where you know, like 9, 7% is considered very low. Uh, moreover, very f not everybody takes this exam. Only the very best students in each school take this exam. So our questions are targeting. Are these quotas working? Are they consistent with helping the underprivileged get into college? Once they're in there, are they catching up? Moreover, are they actually gaining from going to more selective majors versus less selective majors? So what's the uh, two dimensions we look at here? Wages and stress levels. And why would you think they wouldn't gain from going to more selective labels? Surely if they don't gain, why are they choosing to go to more selective majors? And it's not that they are you know, um, uninformed or something, but it's that when you go to a more selective major, you have consumption value. You get to brag. I'm taking computer science in this. And it could well be that this consumption value outweighs any losses in monetary terms. Targeting. So in our um, paper, we showed that about 90% of these applicants would not have gotten in without the reservations. So the creamy layer part, the 10% who would have gotten in, that's relatively small. Minority students, you'd also worry, even if they are, you know, um, uh, they wouldn't have gotten in, are they actually poorer than the ones they're displacing? Because after all, you want to get the underprivileged rather than, you know, the privileged uh, uh, ones who just happen to fall into the category. Um, so yes, we find very much so. The minority students are from poorer districts compared to the ones they displace. Um, one of the things we, I'm not going to be able to talk about very much is that when you look at these minority students, the difference seems to be income. The ones who are poor end up behaving very differently from the ones who are rich. And this is part of, I think, the social mismatch that I'll talk about a, a little later. OK, so how? let's look at the first thing, which is catch up. And here, um, Peter Arcadia, Arcadia Kono has, a, I have a hard time pronouncing this name always, um, has a beautiful paper which shows that looking at the evolution of GPA over time is not enough to measure catch up. And his story is based on data on Duke uh, that I'm sure he'll be talking about later. But the idea is that, look, the variance of grades within a major may change over time. So you might have a hard grading system in the first year and an easier one in the second, third, fourth years, in which case you might see something that looks like catch up, like the people who started out behind catching up, but it's really just because of grading. The grading criteria across majors may differ and people may choose different majors. So what we do is we look at the final performance relative to initial performance within a major. So we're controlling for a major, and we um, are seeing how they fare. So for example, if you start out in the 20th percentile and end up in the 10th percentile, you're falling behind. Since we're looking within majors, we have far less of a problem than uh, uh, usual papers where uh, you can choose your uh, courses, etc. So well, I want to draw your attention to um, the dark lines, which are the general category. So in both selective and non-selective majors, uh, we had to group them uh, a little broadly because we didn't have that many data points. We only had 450-odd students. Um, you can see that it's roughly along the 45-degree line. So you start off in you know, the 60th percentile. You end up roughly in the 60th percentile. Of course, at the top and the bottom, it's away from this. But this is basically because when you're at the top, you have nowhere to go but down. And when you're at the bottom, you have nowhere to go but up. So you know uh, that makes perfect sense. But now look at the second uh, set of lines, the lighter lines. 
The dashed ones are the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and non-selective majors, and those look a little steeper than the ones in selective majors. In the selective majors, it's very clear that even if you start out in the 40th percentile, you end up in the 20th percentile. So the way we like to think about this is sort of, um, when you think about Ale uh, the Lewis Carroll and uh, the Red Queen's land, and through the looking grass, you're running as fast as you can to stay in the same place. So if you started out behind, you're certainly not going to catch up. You'll just fall further behind. Okay. What about wage gains? Well, here we have a really major econometric problem, and that is better students go to better majors. Just like in the US, all the work on does going to Princeton or Harvard get you more than going to Penn State? Um, Alan Kruger had this great paper which collect, collected, for, you know, corrected for where you were admitted and then said, well, if you chose to go to Penn State over Princeton, well, you started out with six, seven percent less, but you caught up in a few years. Well, this is the same problem here. If better students go to better majors, then Part of the reason you might be getting higher wages for them would be because they're just better. So look at the mean differences. In the general category, you're getting an increase in roughly $3,600 from going to a selective major relative to a non-selective major. In the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, it's only $1,400. This is just mean without correcting for selection. You can control for selection in two ways. One is on observables, which is, you know, what was your GPA, how smart were you, whatever you have data on. And also on unobservables through correlation in error terms. And when you control for selection, the mean difference falls, but it falls a little bit in the general category, and it actually becomes very negative and significant in the scheduled car, scheduled tribe. So it suggests that at least for these students and this environment, which is very challenging for them, they would have been better off going to, a less, to less selective majors in terms of their earnings. We do the same thing for social mismatch. Here we look at stress, <laughs> okay? And so in the general category, um, the, mean dif you know, the mean difference in these two is uh, not significant, slightly positive in scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. It's positive and significant. But again, you have to control for selection. It could be type A personalities who are really stressed out at choosing the selective majors, and that's why you're seeing them stressed. It couldn't, it maybe there's not the selective majors that are causing the stress. So when you control for selection, the general category, it becomes a negative, saying actually being in a selective major you're sort of in the zone and you know, you're less stressed. Um, and scheduled car, scheduled tribe, it's very much, it's very significant and you are more stressed. So uh, to summarize, um, our evidence, even though it's on a small group of students, it's in a very interesting environment and it has very interesting implications. It says if you throw people into a situation where they're completely unprepared, it's going to be a disaster. They're not going to be able to catch up. You're not doing them any favors. Secondly, you may be losing not just in terms of monetary considerations, but in terms of psychological considerations. The levels of stress in these places is phenomenal. They used to ban the roofs because people used to jump. Okay? Um, what does this mean? Does this mean there's no hope? No, not at all. In re related work we've been doing on Turkish data, we find that the disadvantaged in various ways actually do better, they learn more when they're allowed to retake exams. And that makes sense. If you're right at the frontier of what your ability is, if you've taken the exam 20 times, 100 times, you're not going to learn anything from retaking. But if on the other hand, you haven't had all the benefits, then allowing people to retake makes them learn much faster than people who've had all the benefits, which suggests that things like summer school, special programs to bring people to catch up, um, especially the more gifted, uh, these could be enormously valuable. 
Thank you. I hope I didn't go too much over time. Uh, the, the paper that I'm going to talk about uh, this morning is uh, entitled, Does Affirmative Action Create Educational Mismatches in, in Law School? And first of all, just to uh, restate, restate the mismatch hypothesis. Uh, this paper focuses on uh, whether or not uh, racial preferences affect the amount of learning that goes on in school. Uh, and we can, we can state that hypothesis as saying that a, a student is going to learn more if her credentials are, thank you, if her credentials are similar uh, to those of her median classmate at her institution compared to what she would have learned had she gone to an institution where her academic credentials, her entering academic credentials were significantly less than, uh, than the median student. The, uh, uh, the data that's used in this study is uh, it's called the Bar Passage Study. It's a very unique data set. Um, it tracks uh, 27,000 law students that entered law school in 1991. That's about two-thirds of the enrollees. There were three follow-up surveys. Two of those surveys occurred while they were in, in law school. Um, and bar exam outcomes were tracked <laughs> for three years uh, after law school. Uh, what makes uh, law students unique to study mismatch uh, is first there are significant racial preferences at law school, and I'll show you some data about that in, in just a moment. But also, everybody in law school takes an exam. They take the bar exam. And this is pretty unusual uh, among institutions. Not every four-year graduate takes an exam at the end of, at the end of college. Uh, so there's, there's actually a way to measure learning because all students are required to take the bar. Uh, well, how do we use the bar passage study to uh, test mismatch? Well, we have in the bar passage study, uh, we have uh, variation in the data where we have minority students uh, at institutions of varying amounts of selectivity but with the same credentials. Uh, so what the mismatch hypothesis predicts is that uh, those students attending more selective schools will learn less than students with the same academic credentials who attend less selective schools. The, the BPS is a very rich data set, has a lot of demographic data about students, a lot of background data, uh, but it does have some, uh, uh, some major issues. Uh, one of the issues is that the law school they actually attended is not identified. This was done to protect the anonymity of the people in the data set. Uh, instead, what the, uh, what the researchers did was they combined uh, the law schools into clusters and important determined a, a, uh, defining those clusters uh, were the, uh, the median LSAT and the median college GPA, the institution you're attending. But there were other factors that went into it as well, like tuition, size of school. So it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a decent measure of selectivity, but, but still crude. And you can arrange these clusters into tiers of selectivity. Uh, but it's almost certain that the tiers overlap. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a variable that's measured with, with error. Uh, one of the uh, other challenges is uh, unobservable characteristics of students, uh, which could bias the results. And, and in some data sets, uh, non-experimental data sets, information is actually there to effectively control for an unobservable differences problem. Uh, that information is not in the BPS. So you have to come up with, with other strategies. All of these problems make it harder to find mismatch, not easier. Uh, how does this paper compare to uh, uh, previous research? How is it different? Uh, well, different in two ways. Uh, one of the key differences in this paper, I focus on outcome measures uh, that directly measure learning. Uh, previous papers have focused more on the production of lawyers. So previous papers have, have asked the question, 
Uh, does it, affirmative action increase or decrease the number of minority lawyers? Uh, this paper is not looking at that issue, but it's looking at the direct issue of, of how does mismatch affect uh, learning outcome measures, such as, as uh, passing the bar. Uh, the second way in which it's different is that this paper attempts to deal with some of the problems of the BPS. When it, I've already mentioned these two. The measurement issues with uh, the selectivity of the law school you actually attended, that was called TIER, uh, and also possible unobservable differences uh, between the students that are attending more selective schools and non-selective schools, even those that have the same observable academic credentials. So the, the outcome variables uh, in this paper, uh, two that I focus on, uh, one I call pass bar ever. Uh, success is eventually passing the bar. Uh, failure is, is, is failing the bar. And passing the bar first time and success is passing it on your first attempt and failure is failing it on your, on your first attempt. Uh, just to give you a little, uh, a little data here, uh, here's a, uh, a table which shows the, the difference between uh, an individual's academic index and the, the median academic index at the tier uh, that the student is attending. Uh, the academic index has been used pretty widely in this literature. It varies between 0 and 1,000. Uh, 400 points goes toward the GPA, 600 points toward the LSAT. So if you had a perfect GPA and a perfect L LSAT to get 1,000 points, if you had the minimum on those measures, you'd get 0 points. Uh, so 100 points is equivalent, equivalent to a 1-point GPA. Uh, so from a B to an A or from a C to a B is equivalent to 100 points. Um, so uh, whites uh, on average are uh, nine points of the, of the academic index above the, the median at the, the tier they're attending. Uh, blacks are 145 below. And minority, which includes black, Hispanic, and Native American uh, is 120. Uh, here's just some raw data on uh, bar passage rates out of the, the BPS. Uh, so passing the bar first time, 92% uh, of whites, 61% of blacks. Uh, for the minority group as a whole, 67%. Uh, passing the bar eventually, 97% white, 78% uh, black, and 82% minority. Uh, keep in mind, a lot of these uh, the gaps can just be explained by differences in academic credentials. And if you control for differences in academic credentials, the fact that um, blacks and minorities come in with weaker academic credentials on average, uh, you can explain about a half to two-thirds of this gap. But about a third to a half remains even after you control for academic credentials. Okay, so here's uh, the, uh, some results from the paper. The, uh, the first two columns uh, are using uh, uh, the, the methods in this paper are uh, 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 sort of spring from uh, uh, a paper which I consider really the best paper uh, in, in this field in terms of the previous research, which was a paper by Albert Yoon and Jesse Rothstein. Um, and the first two columns really show their analysis, but they did not run their analysis on these two variables. Uh, so this adds these two variables to, to basically their methodology. And in the first two columns, what they're comparing is there's six tiers. They're comparing the top two tiers and the, and, the, and the bottom four tiers. So the question they're asking is, if you compare a student, two students with the same academic credentials, how, do their, uh, how does their success rate on the bar change as they move from a non-selective school to a selective school? Again, where a non-selective school is defined as the four bottom tier a selective school is the top two tiers. Uh, and what you find is, what we see is we see all the results are, are negative. They're pretty small. Uh, the asterisk means it's statistically significant. It's only one of these four results statistically significant. In the third and fourth column, what I do is I uh, try to correct for the fact that these tiers overlap and it's a crude measure. And the way I do that, I just omit the, the middle two tiers. So now I'm comparing students at the bottom two tiers with the top two tiers. And what you see is the results get a lot stronger. They're bigger. 
Um, and the interpretation, if we look at the 0.14 for blacks passing the bar first time, the interpretation of that is, is that if you take a, a student from the top two tiers and move that student to the bottom two tiers, their chances of passing the bars, bar increases by 14%. Uh, so that's, that's the interpretation. Uh, these results are all strong enough to explain uh, the remaining uh, bar passage gap. Uh, that, that, that we saw earlier. Uh, these are regressions uh, which uh, continue to compare top two tiers with bottom two tiers, but they go a little further and, and they try to uh, control for this, the, the unobservable differences between the two groups. So you might think that, uh, there's reason to think that if we look at students that have the same academic credentials, <coughs> but uh, one of them is at a selective institution, one of them is a non-selective institution, we might think, well, the one at the selective institution might be there because they have better unobservable academic credentials. They had better letters of recommendation, um, they had a better essay, uh, and those unobservable differences, again, make it harder to find a mismatch. So in the first two columns, what I do is I just restrict the analysis to students that were admitted to their first choice school. Uh, so this is a way of just making the, uh, the data a little more homogeneous in terms of the quality of the unobservable differences. Uh, in the second two columns, um, I use a, an instrumental variables method where I use whether or not, again, that, that it's restricted to first, second choice students, students that got admitted to their first choice school. But I use that as an instrument to, again, control for the, for the unobservables. And again, what you see is all the results are uh, as mismatch hypothesis would predict, they're all negative, meaning that if a student goes to a more selective school so they're more mismatch, they do, they do worse on the bar. And uh, for the most part, most of the results are, are, very, are very statistically significant. Okay, so what are, what are the conclusions that I draw from this research? Uh, well, the first conclusion is, is that if you focus on bar passage results, and you focus on students that actually take the bar, uh, there's, there's, there's strong evidence here that there is a fact mismatch in law school. Uh, the magnitudes of, of mismatch are very difficult to determine from this data set that will require better data, although the values of those coefficients, again, appear capable of explaining <laughs> the, uh, the racial gap in bar passage rates. And finally, what, what's really needed uh, to further understand the importance of mismatch and the magnitude of mismatch is, is better data. And better data would require information about the law school students attended, the state that they took the bar, their actual score of the bar, not whether they just passed it or failed it, but actually what they scored on the bar, and a, and a record of schools that they actually applied to and what the application decisions were at those schools. Well, that sort of data, uh, we, we could really uh, get a lot better information about the magnitude of these effects. Okay, well that's the paper, thank you. Um, the speakers, may I invite you to come and uh, sit up front? Okay, so uh, we've heard these interesting papers. We have about 25 minutes for uh, questions, and I'd invite you to um, pose your questions. There's uh, someone circulating out there with a microphone. And um, please identify yourselves and state your questions succinctly. If you want to direct them to a particular speaker, you can do so. Sir? Uh, James Sang, um, does Professor Antonovics have any data on graduation rates at the uh, UC system at, between before and after 1996 for minority um, students? Uh, yeah, that, can you hear me? Is the mic working? Okay. Um, that is a part of our data. That's not actually what we are looking at in this paper. I believe that Peter Sidiakono in, in the second panel 
is going to be talking more about graduation rates and how those changed uh, after Prop 209 went into effect. So I'm going to defer your question for him because he is the expert in this room on, on the impact of Prop 209 on graduation rates. Is that fair, Peter? Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm going to face back. Uh, I'm Rick Lempert, Merritt, his professor at University of Michigan. Uh, Daryl West, the head of this group, assured me there'd be a robust discussion. I hope you'll indulge me for about three minutes of a statement as opposed to specific questions. Uh, for those of you who have not been involved in the debate, uh, you probably know the critique that's made of uh, newspaper stories on things like climate change, uh, where they feel compelled to have one on each side. Uh, the, all papers today are one side of a debate. Uh, the other side is not represented, even though if you look at the numbers of people involved, uh, the people who've written articles that conflict with what you've heard and will hear uh, far outnumber the people who are presenting. Uh, Rick, Sander, and I go back a very long time. We've been debating this in print and orally um, since his first article came out. Um, the results of these debates, I will confess, uh, depend upon the people we're debating before. When we debated before the American Sociological Association, I won hands down. Before the Federalist Society, he got wild applause. Uh, and too often, it's the case that people's views depend on the views they came in with, in part because it's very difficult to deal with these technical issues in ways that people not familiar with the data uh, will understand. Uh, Rick and I have both said uh, on several occasions that what we'd really like to have happen is to have some first-rate methodologists deal uh, with these uh, issues. Uh, in fact, this has now happened, uh, that in connection with the Fisher case, there's a brief um, which is signed uh, and, in fact, was written in, in a large part by people who've had no uh, involvement of the debate who may not even favor affirmative action, but they include some of the nation's leading methodologists in the social sciences. Those who know them will know the name Don Rubin, Gary King, Rick Sander, Guido Embens. And they basically say in their brief, and anybody really interested in this topic should look at the briefs on both sides from social scientists in the Fisher case. Uh, they say that the work that Rick has done and the work that Mr. Williams has done uh, really deserve no credence in the debate because of fundamental methodological flaws. Uh, I can't explain these uh, to you in the time that exists, um, but I encourage you, and I actually have a handout I'd be happy to share uh, with anybody interested in just seeing the other side of the debate. I do want to comment very briefly uh, on, and you can respond, the panel may wish to respond, uh, on uh, several of the points that were made. Uh, on the first paper, um, I think there's a serious conceptual problem with the paper in its choice of using yield rates as a, mem as a measure of chilling effects. Uh, if you are chilled, you do not apply to a school. If you apply to the school, it's because you are willing and interested in attending that school uh, for whatever reason. It could be your family's nearby, it could be that in California, they had something like the 10% plan, though not 10%, and you know you're sure to get in. Uh, and for that reason, uh, I think the um, far better measures would be application uh, and uh, other rates. I don't think this deals with warming. With respect to credentialing, uh, I also would suggest a different interpretation of the uh, data. Excuse me, I'd like uh, to encourage you to, to conclude I, I your will, remarks. I will, I will have, I'll take no more than about a minute, okay? A minute and a half. 60 seconds, thank you. Uh, the credentialing, uh, it means if you have poor credentials, you probably didn't get into a better school. With respect to Mr. William, or Professor Williams' paper, uh, he has omitted uh, the two middle tiers where most of the minorities are. Uh, the bottom tier, uh, the bo very bottom tier, are HBCUs, which are culturally quite different from all the other schools. And in fact, minorities who go to HBCUs do somewhat better than you'd expect based on their credentials. Uh, last bit of data with respect to the bar passage rates of those minorities and blacks in particular who get very large boosts from going to the most elite tier, the top 18 schools, their bar passage rate 
is 94%, uh, not very different than the bar passage rate of the white students. So there's an awful lot of controversy that uh, is not visible from what the panelists have said. Thank you very much. I, thank you. So uh, Rick Sanders is going to take a moment to respond to uh, that comment. Yeah, um, I, I'm sort of glad Rick raised these issues early on. Um, uh, most, most, of, most of the substantive response I think should come from the panelists whose papers he addressed, but I just want to make a, a few general comments. Um, this, the panelists that we have today are, are very ideologically diverse. I, I, I'm not sure that there's anyone that we've invited who came into this research with an attitude that they wanted to show that affirmative action was ineffective. Uh, lots of the people who you'll see, you've already seen and we'll see in other panels are very agnostic about actual policy issues concerning affirmative action. That's part of the reason why their involvement in, in this research was so valuable and why it's so exciting how this, how this research has developed over the last few years. The research that Rick Leppard is talking about, unfortunately, is, does not share that characteristic. The studies that he champions tend to be highly ideologically driven studies. And many of them are blatantly intellectually dishonest. To give one example, Rick's, uh, one of Rick's students, Catherine Barnes, wrote an article which appeared in the Northwestern Law Review a few years ago that was very harshly critical of law school mismatch hypothesis. It turned out that all of her data was false. We don't know if it was fabricated or if it was just very sloppy work, but it was all incorrect. Uh, Doug Williams, when he first got involved with this research, uh, documented that these, uh, these, these failures of the research. And, uh, and after a process, Northwestern brought in peer reviewers. Barnes admitted that, that she could not replicate the results. The research was redone. And, and when it was redone with correct numbers, it strongly supported the mismatch hypothesis. So the reason why we haven't uh, invited people from that camp to, to participate today is that we just feel that they represent a very skewed and not intellectually sound uh, methodology. Rick mentions a brief that was submitted by the court that purports to refute mismatch. It doesn't mention, uh, it barely mentions a lot of the research that we talk about today, even though much of that research is cited in the brief. It doesn't talk at all about the first choice, second choice uh, uh, methodology that is central to Doug's paper and some of the strongest evidence for law school mismatch. So this, this highly selective reporting uh, and, and, and debate stuff, we just don't think is, uh, is particularly productive in the debate. We think that we've got the best group of scholars working on this. Um, I was going to mention this later, but, but Stuart Taylor and I have written a book called Mismatch that uh, is available for the first time in the lobby of Brookings today. It, just, it was just published, and it's about a lot of the research that's discussed today, but it's also about the debate and about sort of what have been the issues in the debate and the stories behind the people involved in it. So, uh, uh, so if you're interested in that aspect of it, th you, you might be interested in the book. Let me go back to the panelists. Um, there were some questions directed about the papers themselves. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Rick. Rick. Kleppert? I'm sorry. Um, and I think the panelists, uh, to the extent that they would like, should have an opportunity to respond briefly before we take further questions. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> since I was the first paper, I'll start. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to address the sort of the, the, the broader issue that you raised. Um, I, I, have, I myself personally have very mixed feelings about affirmative action. I'm not part of the pro or con camp on affirmative action. Uh, I'm very proud of the intellectual honesty with which I conduct my research, and I, I certainly bristle at any suggestion that I came into this research with a particular point of view, um, because I certainly um, have and continue to fluctuate in terms of my, my views about affirmative action broadly. Uh, the one particular comment. I never, I never said anything about anybody's views. I talked about, I'm sorry. I never said anything about anybody's views. I don't know what your views are. What I did say was that the research presented here presented only one side of a debate, uh, and there's a much larger literature that comes out on the other side, which I might also note is mainly peer-reviewed, whereas I don't believe any of the papers we've heard or have been published on, uh, by Rick or others have been subject to the kind of rigorous peer review that social science journals have and we expect. Yeah, so that's, that, that's factually inaccurate. So the paper that Rick and I wrote together was peer-reviewed and was recently uh, accepted at the American Law and Economics Review, which is a peer-reviewed journal. So um, 
I, I, just, I, I just feel the need to defend the intellectual honesty of, of my work. Um, the suggested, but the point that you made about uh, the fact that only students who would apply might be those who were actually interested in, in being admitted, I think, is a very valid point. And it's one that uh, I was very concerned about in the paper, that the only students now, after the, the ban on affirmative action has gone into place, the only students who bother applying are those who are very interested. And so when they're admitted, they, they, they immediately go. Um, and so, but one of the, the things sort of countering that is that it turns out application rates, and I have a paper with, with Ben Backus, who's also in the audience, the application rates actually were remarkably resilient after, after Prop 209. I, I don't think that speaks to the chilling effect per se for the reasons I, I mentioned in my presentation, but um, you didn't see a large drop in application rates at, at all. In, in the, in, in, and so that tends to um, suggest that it, it wasn't just only those students who were very interested in, uh, in, in applying who who, or in attending who applied afterwards. Uh, you know, I don't think we can uh, completely alleviate that concern that you've raised, but the, the application data doesn't, doesn't fully support that, that hypothesis. Doug, do you want to say anything? Yeah. Um, is this working? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, you know, I first got interested uh, in this because uh, I, I was, I was interested, in this, interested in this, uh, in this topic and uh, it's a very important topic for higher education, and uh, that's that's what I've devoted my life to. And so I started trying to figure. I started trying to replicate these these papers. And um, you know, I think the brief that uh, Professor Limpert refers to, uh, which I which I have which I've read, it, it's actually if it's a critique of my work, it's also a critique of all the other work he refers to uh, in support. Of, of the mismatch hypothesis is because the, the methods that I use borrow heavily from that literature. Uh, there's a critique in that brief that the, the data is not experimental. That is, it's not, didn't come from a randomized experiment. Well, there'd be very little research done if we simply depended on, on randomized uh, uh, e experiments. When I reviewed that literature, I was struck by a couple of things. There were some very smart people uh, writing these papers, and uh, I enjoyed the papers and learned a lot from them. But what was characteristic, characteristic of the papers was a lack of robustness analysis. So for example, uh, Ian Ayers and Richard Brooks wrote a paper where they omitted the historically black colleges. Well, these are, these are uh, historically black law schools. Well, these are law schools where there are a lot of black students uh, who are well matched. So if you're really trying to understand mismatch uh, and you omit that group of students, and you're, you're omitting a lot of the data. Now, there is an issue of why those students tend to do better. Is it because they're better matched, or is it because there's something about the culture right. of going to an all-black law school? And I, I think that's an interesting question that, that, that needs some further research. But to simply omit it from the paper and not to present the results uh, is a lack of submitting the, uh, the analysis to uh, uh, r robustness test. Uh, the, all the papers he refers to, they, none of them restrict the analysis to people that actually take the bar. So all of those papers uh, use variables where success is passing the bar, becoming a lawyer. Failure is either dropping out of law school or uh, not graduating or not passing the bar. So th those papers have focused on the production of lawyers, and that's an interesting, you know, obviously an interesting question to this debate. But if you're really interested in looking at learning outcomes, then let's look at students who actually took the bar and see how, uh, uh, see how their success varies according to, to how, how well they're matched. Uh, so again, I, I see a lot of my work as uh, attempting to subject a lot of the previous work to more robust tests and to ask, well, is, is there anything here? Uh, and I, I think there's some evidence that there is something there. And I, I'm not ready to make policy based on my analysis alone. Uh, but I, I, th I think what my results suggest is there's something there, and we need, we need to look at this closely. It's not an issue that we simply need to ignore. Well, Doug, can I just ask you something? If you acknowledge that the HBCU law schools are culturally different, and that uh, most of the comparison that you're doing when you compare the bottom two tier to the top two tier is also a comparison of people at HBCU to not, then why do you attribute the uh, difference that you find to mismatch uh, since you can't identify the independent effect of mismatch 
from that of a kind of cultural dynamic that might be going on at these HBCUs? Well, I, I don't think that cultural dynamic has been really well articulated uh, by anyone. Uh, you can't, the truth is you, can't, you cannot identify uh, what the result is. It could be mismatch. It, it could be something, something particular to, the, to those schools. That's probably worth saying, isn't it? And I say that in the paper. I beg your pardon. Just, but just, just one interjection. When, when if you do the first choice, second choice analysis of uh, the law school's data and you exclude the HBCUs, you still find a, a mismatch effect, don't you? I mean, your, 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 your tests did, by doing robustness checks, you mean that you checked it both ways. And many of your results that don't rely on HBCUs still find coefficients statistically significant in the outcomes that you're looking at. Yeah, so the, the, Rick is referring to the, the, uh, the work by uh, Ian Ayers and, and, uh, and Richard Brooks, in which one of their tests is to focus on these students that got admitted to their first choice. And in their, in their paper, again, they only admit, they only present uh, results on, on variables that have to do with the production of lawyers, whether or not you became a lawyer or not. But if you redo their analysis, and this, if you redo their analysis um, using students who actually took the bar, uh, and you omit the, those schools, as they did in their analysis, you do find significant results on passing the bar the first time. Okay, because so, of the importance of this, we're gonna give Rick a brief opportunity to follow up, and then we're going to allow other people to enter into the colloquy. Thank you. Uh, just, just two sort of points dealing with the data. Uh, one is, uh, for those who don't understand, the, the idea behind this first choice, second choice, is the people who are going to their second, uh, to, to their second choice law schools are better matched uh, because they decided not to go to the very top law school. and. Uh, but it's assumption, we don't know, they could be in the same tier. But beyond that, it turns out when you look at the data that a major reason why people choose a second choice is, appears to be financial and financial aid. And therefore, these are people who are able to get scholarships from their second choice law schools. So in fact, they may be every bit as good as the people going to the first choice law schools. The other point, just to respond to, to what Professor Williams, one aspect of what he said, uh, if you, don't include those who dropped out of law schools. You can have a situation like this, uh, where, and this is e exaggerated for effect, but where 100 people go to, let's say, a fifth tier, next to bottom tier law school, 10 graduate, and eight pass the bar. On the first tier law school, 100 people go to the first choice law school, 90 graduate, and 85 or 80 pass the bar. Uh, maybe a higher percentage of graduates pass the bar, but if you don't include the dropouts from these schools who didn't make it even as far as the bar, you get a very distorted effect because these are people uh, of a small group who've succeeded. Ah, hello? And forgive me for not calling on you earlier, of course. Okay, um, so the first thing I want to say is I think it's a little misleading to say that stuff that's talked about today uh, is not published because uh, it's also very new. And in economics especially, it takes up to two to five years to publish something. I think, I mean, we wrote our paper, I think, in the summer, so we've submitted it. We still have not heard back. But we do hope that it will get published soon. Uh, the second thing that I want to sort of say is something more methodological, which is if you take the data today and the data available 10, 20 years ago, it's a sea change, it's a huge change. Today you have administrative data on the population of the people entering all universities. You have um, data on um, all the income tax filers in the US and their histories matched five ways, okay? You never had this in the past. So it's very natural that today we should see some of the earlier work which was based on extremely poor data being called into question. The second methodological thing I want to emphasize is that a lot of the work that we see in the past has been what's called reduced form. You play with various versions of uh, the model, you make stories. This is an essential first step to doing what people these days are doing in the frontier, which is more structural where you put a store model together, you put estimate the entire story together, 
and see whether it holds up and then do counterfactuals. So I think it's very <coughs> inappropriate to say past work is criticized. Of course you're going to criticize. That's how you do better. So I, I, and I, I'm not um, an education person. I'm starting to work in education. I work in trade and development and I had no priors. I really wanted to see uh, this happening uh, in the Indian context and it making a difference. Unfortunately, that's not what I found. Thank you. All right. We still have some time. Um, this woman, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but you will identify yourself. Hi, uh, Peggy Ochowski. I'm the congressional correspondent for the Hispanic Outlook on Higher Education. So um, th three really quick questions. Did, did you look at gender? <clears throat> are the, are, I mean, does it tend to be the majority of the uh, minorities who are being accepted, are they women? Um, is this only on undergraduate? Or are you, did you look at, or are you going to look at graduates? Addressing and your question. The other, and the third one is, did you include um, foreign students, especially foreign students of color, in uh, the minority? Madam, Madam to whom are American? you addressing the question? Um, just whoever would I answer see, to this. the panel. Yes. All right. So gender, foreign students, and um, graduate. So I'll, I'll, I can answer very quickly. Uh, the <clears throat> we don't have any, I would have loved to have uh, done more with gender, but it was not part of the data. Uh, we also did not have information on international students, uh, although I would I'd love to have had that as well. Um, and <clears throat> so it was, it was uh, and, and it was all undergraduates. So <coughs> that, 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 that was the limitation of the data that were available to us. Are you thinking of doing graduates? We just don't have the data. And the graduate admissions process is, is very different from discipline to discipline. I, I, I have a heart. Is the action ban also for graduates? Yes. It is. Okay. Yes. Any other responses from the panel? Philip Richards, um, you're going to need a microphone. Um, I'm an English professor, and I'd like to make an empirically unearned, wholly ad hoc um, question, um, which has to do with your remark. And I wonder um, about the influence of um, networks of information um, in the choice of schools. Um, we sent both of our kids to private schools. I, I've taught at Colgate for 25 years. And my impression is that um, the flip side of mismatch is match. That um, the notion of matches of high school students with college is a incredible topic of upper class conversation and concern in private schools and high end um, high schools um, in America. And a lot of, I think, what you call unarticulated um, kind of um, insights about match um, seems to be conveyed in what people, you know, um, end up describing as profiles of certain schools with which they um, want to match their, um, um, their children. Um, to a certain extent, these people are um, engaged in a market and they have um, to make decisions. And um, I, I'm wondering about the effect that class has to do on, on that kind of decision making. Um, and you're asking whom? Um, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, Mr. Robles? No, w Williams. I'm terribly sorry. Professor Yeah, you know, my work doesn't, doesn't really address class um, uh, directly. You know, I think that's a fascinating, fascinating question. There are these other dimensions of, of match, but it's really just focusing on the match in terms of how your academic credentials compare with those of your classmates. But can I just uh, amplify here, because it seems to me there is a, a, an issue, which is to say that the fit of a student's um, LSAT score or academic index to that of the institution that he or she attain, uh, attends is only one dimension of whether or not that student is well matched to that institution, because both the student and the institution have many characteristics other than the academic index or the median academic index for the school. There may be different teaching styles. There may be whatever. Okay, I don't know anything about this really, but the matching process isn't just the matching of 
I know enough to ask this question. I don't know enough to answer it. <laughs> the matching process isn't just matching test score to test score. It's also matching this whole vector of characteristics of the student to the vector of characteristics of the school. And it may be that minority students are, for whatever reasons, class or otherwise, systematically disadvantaged in executing that part of the matching. And you will be attributing to uh, mismatched test scores what's actually due to mismatched ability to manage the other dimensions of the matching process. Am I clear? Yeah. OK, so that's my, that's my question to uh, whoever wants to uh, take it up. Well, I think this is two dimensions. One is in terms of applications. You may find people not applying to places where you know, they have a good chance of getting in just because they don't know. And the second is when you do get in, um, are there other dimensions which make you less able to cope than uh, your peers who may look similar in terms of grades or scores? OK, I think we should take some other questions. This gentleman here. Please identify yourself. Yes, uh, <clears throat> good morning. My name is Jamal Abdulalim, uh, correspondent with Diverse Issues in Higher, ed higher Education. Uh, my question is for um, Kala Krishna. Uh, I happened to do a, a tour of India last year around this time where uh, I looked at higher education uh, in general and affirmative action in particular. I was there at a really interesting time because at that time, uh, the movie about affirmative action in higher education called Adrakshan was released and it was banned in, in, in some of the places, um, uh, some, some of the cities in, um, in India. In any event, uh, I had a question about um, just the conclusion that you reached. Were you saying that for the scheduled tribes and, ca and caste, that it's better for them just not to pursue higher education? Or, uh, because that, that was kind of, the, the statement that you said could be interpreted th that way. No. And I was hoping you could kind of elaborate and clarify exactly what you were saying. No, absolutely not. I'm saying exactly the opposite. I'm saying when you take people and put them in a situation where they're out of their depths, it's not unexpected that you should find that they struggle. The right way to deal with this is to do what some of these institutions are already doing, which is trying to have summer courses to bring people up to speed and uh, providing maybe, they already do this, they provide longer times for people to graduate, but maybe having more mentoring, having more one-on-one, -on -one, where are you behind, how can you catch up? I actually think that um, the program to be most effective has to incorporate much more of this bringing people up to speed. What's a year in your life if it'll make you better able to deal with the institutions that are willing and <coughs> need to have people of diverse backgrounds in them. So I'm just for preparation more. And our work on Turkey shows that if you take a smart kid from a backward, uh, bad background, whether it's going to bad schools, whether it's having poorer parents, give them the input, they catch up faster. So it says that there's a lot you could do if you just take that approach. All right, our next panel is going to start in five minutes or so. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank um, our presenters uh, and our questioners for a robust discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>